Hi, this is Miss Linton. It's a Friday afternoon, and we've got some AP Bio students here. Say hi. Hi. All right. So this is Unit Four, okay? And this is about cell communication. And this was our full-on hodgepodge unit, right? Because um, this is new for the College Board just to have a whole unit on cell communication and cell signaling. So. We scaffold it together with several different examples. If you recall, we talked about the um, nervous system versus the endocrine system, right? Um, we focused on the immune system and the cell signaling that goes on there. Um, and then part which was required, like that you could relate to a chapter, was we talked about the cell cycle and we talked about mitosis. And remember we talked about the way that the cell cycle is regulated. Um, we also talked about feedback, maintaining what? homeostasis, both positive and negative feedback mechanisms as cell, cell communication. So there's a lot that you could use. We looked at flowering plants, right? And we, and, okay, that's weird. Weird sirens are going off in case you don't know. And then, what's going on out there, do you know? Okay, and we talked about plants, Luke, go see if we're safe. Um, go out there. Move, save yourself. Um, I am your father. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. And we talked about flowering plants and their response to light. So I know we talked about a lot, so we'll try to just hit like big ticket items. If there's something you want me to go over, I'll definitely go over that. Um, last time we were here, okay. Last time when we reviewed this, I kept the list of things you had wanted me to go over. And this was your list that you made. <laughs> so I don't know if there's some of those things that you would like me to go over again. I can. I have pictures for those things if you would like. A um, couple of things on the big ticket. Um, let's talk about chapter 40 was we did a little bit of that about hormones in the endocrine system. Remember, we might have mentioned endocrine and exocrine. So endocrine is when you have a gland, right, that's secreting some sort of chemical into your blood, and it's moving through your blood, and how does that, in cell signaling, how does it know, how does it make a reaction? How does it cause a reaction in other cells? There's a what? I see a hand. That's right. She made the receptor sign. So there's receptors, right, for different, a different cell who can respond to that signal that was sent by the gland. Also, you have exocrine glands, that would be different. That would be like a sweat gland. It's something that puts it outside of your body, but you can also send signals that way too. Do you remember what those signals were called? It starts with a P, but it makes a F sound. Pheromones, nice, pheromones. And that is when you're trying to signal one organism signaling to another organism. It could be, this is my property, keep away. That's like dogs peeing on everything in your yard kind of the saying, hey, this is my property, or it could be a come hither, I'm interested in you, kind of a signal. So there's lots of different signals that you could send. So when we look at the distance in which they travel, when you talk about um, hormones, you have some sort of glandular tissue putting in the blood and you have receptors for it. Um, you could have neurosecretory cells that are like a nervous cell, um, like a neuron, but also like an endocrine gland, that's neurosecretory, they're like a combination. Um, and then neurons themselves, that's the closest form of signaling. Um, there's just a small space between two neurons and you have um, one neurotransmitter getting released by one neuron and going immediately to the receptors on your next neuron. And that's why the nervous system is so much faster than the endocrine system, but the endocrine system um, effects can last much longer. Um, we talked about positive and negative feedback. Remember, which one is more gets you more? Positive. It keeps getting you more and more and more until you have some climactic event, whereas negative feedback is more gets you what? Less. Okay. And so you're trying to bring it back into homeostasis. You're hovering around a set point in negative feedback. It's not negative like bad. Okay. It's just correcting. It's correcting to the set point. Whereas positive feedback, you're going more and more in a singular direction. Okay. Um, we looked at things like temperature, and temperature would be an example of what kind of feedback? 
negative feedback because it's trying to maintain your body at a certain temperature. We talked about birth being an example of positive feedback. I'm going to tell you just having from starting to grade some of the essays, I, I cautious you, caution you, when you say giving birth is positive feedback, you have to tell me how it is positive feedback, right? So you have to be able to explain it, not just list things in your mind, okay? So it's positive feedback because when the head of the baby pushes on the cervix, that nerve impulse goes to the brain and there in your pituitary gland, you secrete oxytocin and oxytocin makes the uterus contract even more. And when the uterus contracts, the head gets pushed against the cervix again. So then you have a stimulus received in your pituitary gland. So it keeps amping up that, that cyclical response. Um, you can have contrary or antagonistic hormones where um, one hormone to get your blood sugar back right, one hormone like insulin will lower blood sugar where another hormone like glucagon will what? Break. So these are all chemicals in your body uh, in order that are sending signals that you're receiving and responding to. And we talked about pheromones, we talked about receptors, we talked about secreting too much and too little, the power of tears. Ladies in the room, what is the power of your tears? What can your tears do? Lower the, Lower the testosterone of the men around you. So lesson, hashtag life lesson, don't make us cry. Um, we talked about um, how different hormones work. There's protein hormones versus steroid hormones. And it's basically, where's your receptor located? Your receptor is located on the cell membrane if you are a what hormone? A protein one, right? It's on the cell membrane. And the reason is, you as a hormone, a protein, you cannot cross the cell membrane, right? Because you probably have a charge somewhere on you or you're too large. And so you can't go through the phospholipid bilayer. Whereas steroid hormones, those things released from your testes, your, your ovaries, or your adrenal cortex, those are steroid hormones. And they can, because they're lipid, they can go through the phospholipids. Their receptor is to the interior of the cell. And usually they impact DNA, specifically gene regulation in some way, turning genes on or off. Okay, so where is your receptor located? Another one we looked at, um, we looked at epinephrine. What's another name for epinephrine? Adrenaline. And we looked at the whole G protein, right? Because you have this receptor, which then triggers the G protein. You can see that because the G protein is not on the other side of the membrane, right? So you have a receptor who's going like, tag, you're it. And so then you're activating this G protein, which then activates an enzyme that's embedded in the membrane, which then converts your, um, forms your, C, or your ATP, and then your um, cyclic AMP, so you lose two phosphates, and that is your second messenger. So it's a series that the receptor to the G protein to the actual enzyme adenylate cyclase, and then you're forming your second messenger. Why do you need a second messenger? Because epinephrine is a protein hormone. He stands at the door and knocks, right? So he has something on the surface. And this is showing you how it can trigger something to occur inside the cell. And this would be a good example of signal transduction. Good, signal transduction. And here's just another picture of that. Why doesn't the person with the darkest shirt explain that to their neighbor? Go ahead, dark-shirted one. Explain it to your neighbor. <laughs> Then I just want to point out to you, when you look at sensory receptors, this would be sensory receptors It could be like for taste or pressure or light. These, these are receptors that are going to trigger neurons. So you can trigger neurons directly like pain, okay? You can trigger those receptors directly. Olfactory receptors for smell, you trigger it directly. For taste, you have a receptor who's going to trigger a neuron. So in this case, the receptor for that chemical signal, it's the same thing. Like, I just want you to see that 
that's a conserved process. The signal transduction pathway, what's different on each of these cells is their type of what? Receptor. Are they a photoreceptor? Are they a chemoreceptor, a thermoreceptor? Receptors change, but the pathways are very, very similar. So that's a conserved process that would point towards what? Evolution. Evolution. Good. Okay. Um, then uh, one other thing I just want to remind you is that like taste not limited to the tongue, but we have receptors because that's a chemoreceptor. So we have taste receptors all over our body for bacteria, which makes me think about the immune system. Yes, it does. I don't have a, um, I didn't open that up. up. I can, if you would like, open, open, Dropbox. Oh, I was in the right place. Notebook AP, AP newest. Do you see immune system? If you see it before me, tell me. It's lower. I'm surprised it doesn't have a triple star, so I have it up on top. Sorry, delay of game. Ah, I see it. Is that the newest one? I hope it is. Okay, so on the immune system, something to think about there is we would just rather not have pathogens in our body, right? And um, so we have you know, things on the surfaces of our body to keep pathogens outside. But other organisms are the same. They would rather not have pathogens in their body. And we saw the evolution of the immune system, right? From slime molds who have sentinels that move all over. Let me find that, right? So we don't want pathogens in our body. Slime molds have those sentinel, sentinels when they are in their multicellular arrangement that patrol their whole uh, slimy body and look to see if there's anything out there that they need to attack. Um, we looked at this idea of PAMPs and TLRs. At an R is usually gonna be, if something ends in R, it's probably some sort of receptor, right? So you are detecting some sort of pathogen. That this, that's the P in PAMP is some sort of pathogen. So this is how we are, right? Because we have B cell receptors and T cell receptors in our specific immunity. Um, and we looked at different examples of those. We looked at what the signal cell signaling looks like inside of our um, cells, that it's pretty complicated. Um, we brought up, because we couldn't really talk about the immune system without talking about the circulatory system. So the circulatory system is a highway for multiple signals, right? For hormonal signals, it allows your immune system to travel through it, right? Do your immune cells stay only in your blood, though? No, they move out into the what fluid as well? What other fluid? They move out in the tissue fluid as well. And it's extensive. Um, you have uh, veins in your lymphatic vessels in order to keep the fluid moving in one direction. And remember, if you can't get all that fluid out and recovered and returned to your circulatory system, then you can get a slight swelling. Um, slight. <laughs> Um, when we look at the organs of the lymphatic system, your bone marrow is a big deal and your thymus gland is a big deal. Whose thymus gland is bigger, yours or mine? Oh. That's right, because you're younger. Mine's like, okay, I know cell from non-cell. Um, but all, all blood cells come from your bone marrow, right? But whether they mature and grow up there, that's the way you tell the difference between B and T cells, right? B cells mature in the bone marrow, whereas T cells mature in the thymus gland. So that's the significance of those. Then these two right here, your spleen and lymph nodes. So your spleen filters your blood. It's where immune cells can hang out and make sure that everything in your blood is okay. Whereas, give me the lymph node. What is it monitoring? Tissue fluid, making sure that there's no pathogens in your tissue fluid. And it doesn't have to be everywhere. Where's the only where place your patrollers actually need to be? In the nodes. Because everything's going to pass through the node before it gets returned to your circulatory system. So just patrol the nodes and you've got it covered, right? If an alarm goes off, if some cytokines are released because you have an infection, there's an intruder alert, well, then you can move because that's a chemical signal, right? That cytokine cell signaling. It's signaling you, hey, we have an intruder, so we need to head to that area and take care of that problem. What's well, going to facilitate you being able to get out of the blood and into where that damage, like out in a big toe or your ankle is? How, what's going to facilitate that? Starts with an H. 
Histamine, which causes that vasodilation. Do you remember who is histamine released by? Mast cells. cells. So those cells, when the alarm goes off and they come a running, cell signaling, okay, they can get there because that area has now been made available. But what comes with that swelling is that, sorry, I'm almost falling. What comes from that swelling is that, oh, dang it, I just said what comes from. Not only do the cells get out, but you will also get what? Swelling. Swelling. Wait, <laughs> I said it twice. Yay. Okay. So next. So we would rather they just kept out. We can use skin. We can use glands. We can use low pH of our stomach. Um, how do we know who the, that we have somebody that shouldn't be in our body? Cells that shouldn't be there, their surface markers are called what? Antigens, right? If you are attacking your own cells, then your cells have become, like they have an antigen determinant on it. Then they are activating your immune system. What is that called? You attack yourself. Autoimmune disease, right? That's not good. Who should have taught the T cells what to attack and what not to attack? The thymus gland, right? Okay. All right, now, who do we call in? Okay. We call in the good guys, and we talked about this before. All of these are part of your innate, everybody's born with it, innate immune response. They can tell self from not non-self, and they can attack. But bad guys, they, they have adapted, right? So we have cells that go bad. We have, cell, we have viruses that hide within our body cells. <laughs> and so we need to be, oh, sorry. We need to be able to address not only the free-floating pathogens, but those that are hiding within our body cells. And that's the beauty of the specific immune response, right? Because if a B cell receptor comes in contact with an actual pathogen, right? B cell receptor comes in contact with a pathogen. Where's the pathogen? Out in your blood plasma, out in your tissue fluids, right? And then it is triggered, this virgin B cell, to become two cells. What two cells will it become? Memory cell, Memory cell for next time and plasma. plasma cells. The plasma cells will secrete what? Antibodies into the plasma of your blood, okay? They will secrete antibodies there. The antibodies will mark the actual pathogen for destruction. The antibodies cannot do anything to it, okay? They just mark them for destruction. They make them easier targets so you can get rid of all of them. So there's no question, you don't even have to ask. You've got an antibody on you, I'm killing you. End of story, okay? Whereas T cells, the way in which they work is they come in contact with our actual body cells that have either met the antigen and defeated it, or they have become defeated by the antigen. So it's body cell to body cell, T cells or cell to cell combat, right? So they're either saying, oh, you're a presentation cell, this is what you've killed, let me make some more cells that can help you kill. And we will make, I will make only cells targeting for that pathogen so we can address that issue. What kind of cells are those that they make? Cytotoxic T cells. Cytotoxic T cells, they, they're the ones that are gonna kill. But we also wanna facilitate the reaction. We want some cells that can coordinate it and release more chemicals to draw more fighters to us. What kind of cells are those? Helper T cells. And then in addition, they also secrete memory cells. Memory cells for next time. When you have a virgin cell, okay, they, it's their first time, they never come in contact with the pathogen, you wanna make sure you just don't start, to, we need checks and balances, we don't wanna start <coughs> making, bless you, millions of cells, you almost gave her a heart attack. You don't, want, you don't wanna start making millions of cells when you don't need to. So those are, you need to be, remember we said, um, let me jump to that, da, 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 da. where are you? Here you are, huh. Remember the inappropriate dendritic cell? exposing himself. Okay, sorry. So this phagocyte dendritic cell, dang it, look away, look away, um, engulfs the pathogen, right? Destroys it and says, look what I have killed. Does anybody recognize it? <laughs> he does. <laughs> Why can't it be like coming out from under his arm or on top of his head? No, no, it has to be there. And he's like looking and smiling. Okay, now, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so this helper T cell comes in contact with it and says, Ahoy, matey. <laughs> I think you are a bad guy. And now he is activated. Okay? Same bad guy. You have this virgin B cell. He doesn't recognize 
Um, number one, number two, whoa. Okay, oh yeah, back to you again. He doesn't recognize one or two, but he does recognize this one. Then the two virgins need to get together and say, bad guy, yeah, I met a cell that presented to me. That's what the T cell would say. The B cells, I'm coming direct contact with this guy. Let's start. And then that's when you get the process of making antibodies and triggering your innate immune response. Remember, we compared and contrast who they battle, who they attack, right? Okay. And you have plenty of pictures in your notes where you can go over that process of how they attack. Um, do you need me to differentiate between, real quick, MHC1, MHC2? Okay. Let me show you a picture. T cells have T cell receptors, B cells have B cell receptors. B cell receptors, they will be attached to the actual pathogen, okay? The actual pathogen, that's their receptor. T cells, they need to talk, T cells talk, T cells talk, and so the way they talk is they've got to have, um, they have two kinds of receptors, receptors for MHC1s and MHC2s. And that's the only way you can um, talk to a T cell. So this would be one, one cell with its MHC2, two arms holding it. And then this could be a totally different cell. Okay, so two different cells, a green cell and a red cell. The red cell is presenting the antigen and he's displaying on an MHC1, so you know you're done. That's it, okay? You're, you, this cell, the red cell, is going to be killed because it's saying, I'm infected, <laughs> save yourself, okay? Other cells could also secrete interleukins. That would be a chemical signal telling, hey, viruses are out here, right? Just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay, MHC2s, I will help you. You are somebody who has defeated the pathogen. You are holding it out there, just like that one inappropriate cell was doing, going, hey, I've killed this thing. Is there any virgin out here who recognize it or a memory cell who can recognize it so we can trigger our specific immune response and start making millions of cells to fight this battle? Now, remember, when you're done fighting the battle, they're going to commit apoptosis. You cannot support a body full of army for all the, you know, all the infections you've ever had in your life. So they have to commit apoptosis and you just leave behind the what cells? Memory cells. Okay, so this is showing you MHC1 versus MHC2. MA, uh, MHC1 stabilized from the T cell, the cytotoxic T cell is CD8 protein. Like you're gonna get eight, is how I remember that. And then from the T, the helper T cell stabilizing with CD4. I'm for you, not exactly. Okay, um, are you ready? You can review those notes, I think, or is there anything more you want me to talk about on the immune system that's making you nervous? Yes? Can you use like cytokines in your I can. Okay, so um, when you look at cytokine, cytokine is anything, when you see cyte, that's just a cell, right? And it's releasing a chemical, a cytokine. Interleukins, interferons, okay? Um, Interferons is you're trying to, the way I remember it, or you know, the way it jogs my memory, is it's going to interfere with the viral life cycle, okay? Um, interleukins, you are trying to amplify your response and saying, like, I think I have another picture too. Hang on, hang on. Is it forward, is it? Interleukins, you're trying to amp up your immune response. Maybe. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay. Well, this is really messed up. Okay, so interferons is you've got, you are an infected cell, and you're warning your neighboring cells to be very uh, cautious on who they let come in, being very cautious on who they, you know, even if somebody presents the right signal, because viruses have the ability to basically know the code and how to get in and you have to confirm it and then you let them in your cell. So they're, they're kind of hijacking a code in order to get entrance into your cell. And so it's warning the other cells, don't let them in. There's a virus out there. There's somebody being sneaky out there. That's what your interferon's gonna do. Whereas your interleukin is like an amp up, like let's fight, um, let's you know secrete um, you can hear like that would be the cytokine that this macrophage is releasing would be an interleukin, which would be like, let's go, let's, let's, let's fight harder. It's like the Red Bull of the immune system.
Did I answer your question? Okay. Anything else on the immune system you want me to go over? All right. So there was more in this unit. Okay. Um, we talked about that. That's good. Don't save. Okay. So cell communication, we talked about responding to light, right? Remember the auxin concentrating on the what? Shady side. Um, causing the acid growth hypothesis where it weakens the cell wall, then trigger pressure going into the plant. It, uh, more water can come in because you have a weakened cell wall and then it repairs the wall um, in response. Um, we talked about cell sending signals. Remember cut grass is really just that smell we smell from when people cut the grass is really just grass screaming. Herbivores save yourself. We talked about <laughs> We talked about how some defense mechanisms, um, or you watch the video on how they can secrete chemicals that make whatever is eating them um, change to the next stage in their life cycle so that it stops the process of eating them, or it calls um, you know, a friend, uh, an enemy of my enemy is my friend, it calls them, right? So those are all ways cells could, or plants could defend themselves. Um, endocrine nervous we did, immune system we did, signal transduction, positive and negative feedback, so that leads the cell cycle. Um, okay. Thought I opened that. There it is. Okay. So when we talk about, let's get there. Okay. When we talk about the cell cycle, okay. Um, we have G1, S, G2. We talked about how it's kind of like you can remember it, like if you think about going to an airport, because there's two things that has to happen for you to get on the plane. What has to happen? What? You have to pass through security and you have to have a what? Ticket. Okay. So the tickets are those cyclins we talked about. Right, having the right level of cyclins. Remember, there's all different kinds of cyclins and they're in different concentrations. So you have to have the right cyclin at the right time. Okay, that, that's like your ticket. And then going through security, these are the checkpoints, like the G1 checkpoint, that's when P53 is gonna jump in there and say, ah, mitosis did not go well, we're gonna stop, we're gonna fix it, if we can't fix it, we're gonna kill it. Remember caspases, now they're in the cell, right? Um, so we have different, that's the regulation of it, the control with checkpoints, then we learned the stages of mitosis, and then we talked about out of control, and out of control um, is with cancer. And we talked about the two genes, right? That, um, what are the two genes? Proto-oncogenes, which are actually very good genes. It's just they're in a position of power, so that makes you nervous, because if they mutate, they'll go and be an oncogene, and an oncogene will facilitate a cell cycle. It's saying, yes, 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 let's have more, okay? Now, the check for an oncogene um, is, oh, what was an example of an oncogene? Rats, like stepping on the gas, good. The check for that, if that does go bad, you don't need them unless it goes bad, but if it goes bad, what's the other gene you need? Tumor suppressor gene, tumor suppressor genes um, are like putting on the brakes, right? <laughs> so if you lose your brakes, then, and you've got a oncogene coding for proteins that shouldn't, that's when you end up getting cancer. And who is our example of that? Good. All right. So we talked about what happens during the different stages of the cell cycle. Remember we said G1 is about making more primarily organelles. You will make proteins. S stands for synthesis. Synthesis of what? DNA. G2, we're making more proteins. And then prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. I think you're comfortable with those stages. We've kind of beat that horse. Okay. Um, let's not forget we can take an off-ramp, and that off-ramp is called G0, and we are done. Remember one of the things we looked at with cancer is the activity of telomerase, which keeps the ends of the chromosomes long. Um, people are actually working on that. That goes bad in cancer, but people are working as an anti-aging is to keep your telomeres long so your cells keep rejuvenating themselves. So, um, let's see, let's see. See, oh yes, 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 this is, okay, let's review this. 
Cyclins are the signal, proteins that can activate, activate enzymes called what? Cyc okay, cyclin-dependent kinases, okay? Um, cyclin-dependent kinases are the enzymes when activated that phosphorylate, what is, oh, I already have the answer up there. What does phosphorylate mean? Add to what? Add a phosphate group, okay? So when we looked at this, where are you? Okay, so we had cyclin, so at, at, we have cell signals that will say, let's have more cyclins, as long as they're accurate. Then one of those cyclins can bind to CDK, this enzyme, activating it, okay? And now you have an enzyme substrate complex. And now CDK will phosphorylate a protein that was off and turn it on, or take it on and turn it off in order to regulate that cell cycle. Now, when I look at that, do you remember when we talked about um, epinephrine or adrenaline, right? And there was a receptor, right? And then that receptor um, triggered the what protein? G protein. And then the G protein triggered adenylate cyclase, right? And then that enzyme, right? Enzyme substrate complex, that enzyme took ATP and made it into A and cyclic AMP, which was the second messenger. So do you see this moving of the phosphate being kind of a repetitive, conserved process? Yes? Okay. So what you're activating, you're working with the same, you have the same ingredients in your kitchen, you're just kind of modifying it in different ways. Okay. Um, we looked at um, chromatin um, when it's in an association of DNA with proteins. We looked at histone and non-histone proteins. Do you remember that? His, which one has more variety? Non-histone. Histone are like the spools that you wipe the that you uh, wrap the DNA on, and you have like eight histones together to form a nucleosome. Right? That's when you're like whatever. You're talking crazy. Talk to me, Miss Lynn. In order to form those chromosomes. Okay, then we just went through the stages of mitosis, which I know you're comfortable with, and we already reviewed cancer. Oh, we did it. Okay, do you feel comfortable? A little bit better? You know that I love you? Okay, have good weekends. Remember, this is your last weekend of no fun, right? Get your finals done and then fun, fun, fun. I love you, make good choices.